What are some common things that people can do that should help reduce pain? The biggest one is just move. Like sometimes people's pain is a lot more psychological than it is physical. Working with the right professional for the right thing. If they didn't help you, it's because they failed to meet you where you were. They failed to meet you where you are right now. If we can teach people how to move when they're in pain and how to deal with it, that's better than getting that person out of pain because pain is going to come back. But if we can teach you how to navigate it, that's the best thing that we can do for you. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Joey, nutrition science PhD and founder of Fit for Life Academy. Today's episode was a great conversation with my friend Jonathan Hoke. We talked a ton about injury prevention and ways to reduce pain. If you're somebody who's experienced any sort of pain as a result of training, lifting weights, or just as a result of living your day-to-day -day life, um, I think you'll find some really, really great tips in this episode that will help you reframe the way that you think about pain and injury, and also give you some very actionable tips to help you improve your pain um, and reduce your risk of injury. With that being said, let's jump right into the episode. Hope you enjoy. What's up, Jonathan? How are you doing today, my man? I'm doing well. How are you, Joey? Doing great, brother. Thank you for taking some time to be here today. Oh, yeah. I'm excited. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We were just chatting about uh, video aesthetics and how yes. much nicer your videos are, or at least your camera view is than mine. <laughs> well, so I was nervous that mine wasn't 4K. So, And then I was like, wait, I've been listening to Joey's podcast. Let me just go and look at his videos. And if Mike Rizzatello video looks terrible, then if mine looks me? amazing, then I'll be like, you know, yeah, not even, still not even close to him, but it's okay. I'll you know, there. we were just talking about how like video quality matters, but not a ton. That Mike Israel video was pretty bad quality video, and that video is the best performing video I've ever posted online, at least on YouTube specifically. It's the man, not the camera. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he is the the goat, one of the goats for sure. Absolutely. Um, awesome, man. Well, how about you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, who you are. Um, academic background, professional background. So everybody has a little bit of context of what you do, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So I am the owner of Hoke Health and Wellness, which is just an LLC with health and wellness coaching. What that mainly looks like is exercise, mentorship, and education. So it's a little bit different than what people expect when they hear about personal training or strength training um, in the sense of the main focus is to talk about why we're doing the thing to create autonomous people. Um, but so I, I taking it back to, I got my degree in exercise physiology from Florida state. As I started at Florida state, I actually started in the school of music, um, studying voice. And then I switched when I interviewed at a local gym here in town called seriously strong training. Um, and when I interviewed there, I realized, Oh, okay. I'd worked out my whole life. Very similar to you. You talk about in your first episode, your upbringing in sports and everything else. Um, I was in fifth grade trying to do science fair on fasted sprinting and they wouldn't let me do it. So wait, are you serious? Always, you were trying to yeah. do that in fifth grade? <laughs> yes. She said it was too many variables. Couldn't oh, do man. that experiment. So big bummer there. She, she, um, I just needed Mike Wormsby as my, um, my elementary school teacher, but he wasn't around. Yeah. So, <laughs> but anyways, from that background, you know, I, I'd been in the gym all, all my life, um, actually used to work out with your wife and I also saw you at UFIT a lot when you were working there. Um, but that's, that's what I had done all the way through, you know, starting from sixth grade all the way up was just working out, trying to get better in football, get better in sports. And then in interviewing at Seriously Strong with some of their coaches, I realized, oh my gosh, some of these people are working with individuals on knee pain. They're working with people who are struggling with metabolic conditions and it blew me away. So I immediately was like, okay, I wanted to do therapy, but it sounds like I want to do physical therapy. So what should I do? They basically told me the summary I was given was exercise physiology is the nerdy side. If you want to go on the brute force side, go athletic training. And I was like, all right, nerdy stuff it is. Exercise physiology. Gave up my scholarship, threw all the auditions away and just jumped straight into exercise physiology at Florida State. So throughout that process, I say that to kind of laid down the context of I started working as a coach formally as I started my degree and throughout that degree um, took several certifications and coursework and you know studied from people like Micah Zertel and also like uh, you know Eric Cressy and Postural Restoration Institute individuals and 
just all sorts of different varying backgrounds of trying to figure out how the body moved and how to work well with the people that I was currently with. Um, again, just pushing that to to say that I got a lot of clients I didn't know how to work with while mm-hmm. I was in school. And it was exciting to to get those people, but also nerve wracking where it was like, do I tell them that I have no idea what I'm doing or do I just kind of go with this? <laughs> what kind of back, what kind of route do I take here? So yeah, I went, got my degree. And as I was getting that degree, it was coaching. By the time I graduated, all in all, I was 5,500 hours in, 55 floor hours in on clients, um, which is a lot of time on the floor, especially if you yeah. reflect and work with those clients and keep trying to learn and educate yourself. Um, and found myself at the end of my degree, you know, while my GPA didn't boast that, sitting down with my classmates and uh, studying things. And I had a deeper understanding of what was happening mm-hmm. on the molecular level and on the physical side than what they had before. So while it was brutal and it was it was pretty gnarly to go through school and work full time at the same time, I think it was the one of the best things that I did for getting me to where I am now as a coach where I got done with my bachelor's and started shadowing for physical therapists the last my senior year of my undergraduate degree. And upon shadowing was like, oh no, this wasn't the same revelation I had when I started interviewing to be a coach and seeing physical therapists and what they do for people, at least in Tallahassee. Mm-hmm. Not that there aren't great physical therapists out there, of course, and we'll probably touch on this later, but that was a big eye opener for me where, okay, maybe I don't want to go into physical therapy. I thought this whole time, that's what I was leading towards. That's where I was going. And now it's, nope, not going to go towards physical therapy. So changing routes and just kind of looking around, I found uh, a company called Active Life, which was a company that they they express that they want to bridge the gap between healthcare and fitness, which what I've taken to be, worked for them for a while, and now I'm branching off for my own company, um, worked for them for about a year. And what I've now taken that to express into my company and my own mission and where I'm going is we can change healthcare by elevating coaches rather than blaming doctors, blaming the system, kind of this external locus of control, take an internal focus and be able to teach the individuals how to take an active role in their healthcare, as well as, as a coach, have a robust understanding of tendon health biomechanics, arthrokinematics, which are just, you know, what things are going on in the joint and how they're moving and what kind of things change. Fluid balance changes, recovery, all the things that are taught within physical therapy and probably a little bit within athletic athletic training too, but not at all common knowledge within the coaching realm as a Mm -hmm. whole. Not as much as protein intake or Mm -hmm. hypertrophy training or the things that are you know, I would say medium level of awareness. These are the lowest of the low awareness of mm. what tempo does actually does that actually change about the tensile strength of a tendon? That sounds like fancy wording, but it's just how strong is that tendon and what can make it stronger? Um, so all that to say, that's that's kind of my background. And it's it's sort of a weird middle professional ground between I'm not a healthcare professional. I directly influence healthcare like most coaches do, mm-hmm. but I see myself as a, a much more specialized coach in that I work with individuals on quality of movement, autonomy, and how to be physically free within their own lives and what they want to do. Sweet, man. And so, sorry if you touched on it, but what was the reason that, uh, or what, what deterred you from going down the physical therapy route? Yeah. So in seeing the the setup of care for most of those people, it was kind of the option of, do I want to go to school and accrue a lot of debt right now for something that they're not going to teach me how to do appropriately? So mm-hmm. what I mean by that is I was watching these physical therapists who had been, most of them weren't exercise physiology backgrounds. Most of them were engineering backgrounds or uh, finance background. Um, the, one of the ones I shadowed in particularly was um, his goal was to be a CFA and then in going through the financial courses, his senior year, uh, his grandmother spoke with him and he had some family conversations and decided to go to physical therapy school. So took a couple of prereq classes, got into school yeah. because he had great grades and now as a physical therapist. And the things we would talk about, this is not at all in a, in a uh, 
condescending way or in a cocky way, but I knew more about what was going on at the shoulder joint than he did, which was terrifying to me. I was like, so you either didn't learn that in school or you didn't pay attention and didn't pass. Come to find out this guy got straight A's in physical therapy school. He claims that that was something they never talked about. And it was something that I always challenged. So in that way, I kind of looked at it and I was like, if I'm going to go, I'm not ready. Because the things that they talk about, and I don't know if you you found this within your degree, but if you go back and look at, um, and maybe I'm the only one that does this, but if you go back and look at your lecture slides about cardiovascular changes or adaptations, you know, now I have more questions than I ever had when I was in undergrad because you don't know what you don't know. Totally. You know, you're asking like, but how does that change whenever someone does, you know, because I feel terrible on sets of 20 on squat, but that's not cardiovascular exercise, is it? <laughs> so you start asking about, you know, how stroke volume changes or all those things. So it was twofold. It was first, I didn't feel like I was ready for any sort of higher education. Um, although too many people, I think, go in too early for higher education and and kind of waste the opportunity. But two, it was you're so limited by the box you're put into as a physical therapist, if you have this many sessions with a person, the company allows you to have this much time with each individual. They were doing uh, at CUSPT, we're doing 15 minute assessments for individuals brand new. So you know nothing about this person. You don't know their eating habits. You don't know their movement habits. You don't know what their issue is. All you know is someone's coming in because they're in pain. You have 15 minutes to figure out what it is, how to help them. And give them stuff that's going to help them and not see them again for another week or two weeks. So it was, we were going through in two hours, eight people. Yeah. Shoulder, neck, knee, wrist, ankle. They're all different. Yeah. All individuals. And I was like, I cannot be in a position where I feel completely powerless. And your other option is cash practice. And that's extremely hard to get off the ground. Again, that was more the, I'm not ready for this. Like, I'm not going to understand this as well as I need to if I don't work with more people and see how the body moves better and then try to get educated on rehab stuff. And that was before I found active life and learned under other physical therapists and Kairos about tendon health and all those other things. Yeah. I think at the end of the, at the end of the day, in any field, you get a good amount of information from school and then it's just practice and yep. you're as good as you want to be really because self-education is so important. You have to seek out information you have to, uh, really try and improve as cliche as it sounds every day, right? Get a little bit better every day. And unfortunately, you know, I don't think it's necessarily um, an issue with the way the academic system is set up. Um, I think things just take time, man. And we also can't expect for an institution to give us all the information we need, right? And of course, some professors are better than others. Mm -hmm. Some universities are better than others. Some programs are better than others. And if you go to a shitty program with some shitty professors, like that's not good. But even if you go to a top level university with some of the best professors, there's still going to be stuff you need to learn, right? Because even mm -hmm. though like, let's say four years for a, a higher education degree on whatever the topic may be, four years is still really not a long time, right? You can learn a ton in four years, but you still have more learning to do. Um, but anyways, man, do you mind giving us a little bit of information of what you do with your coaching business specifically? Sure. Yeah. So the main services right now that I provide are in a remote setting and an in-person setting. So it's best described at the in-person setting first. So essentially I take on individuals first. It always starts with a consultation process. And that consultation process looks like a robust assessment before they even pay anything, a robust assessment of where you are right now, what are you trying to do? Basically trying to see if I'm a good fit for them mm -hmm. um, and if they're a good fit for me. Because a lot of times I'll I'll have someone that I actually end up turning away because I'm like, hey, not that I couldn't help you, but you're wanting to do more of this type of training and this person in town will be a lot better fit for you. So I'm going to send you their contact. They're also cheaper <laughs> sometimes. So I'm going to send you their contact information, send you to them, let them know you're coming and I'm going to connect you. Is that all right with you? So Starting with that consultation process, and then once we get through that process, if they assuming they are a good fit, so we don't jump into a 10-minute rant about ethical yeah. sales, but assuming they are a good fit, they come in, they see me in person, and we'll do uh, what we call an assessment process, right? And with that assessment process, it looks like testing mobility, flexibility, 
and strength balance based on what they need. So it's not always a complete full body assessment all the time for data for data's sake. It's, hey, you said you're struggling with these things. Um, let's say they're struggling with hip pain. We're going to assess how well your hip moves. We're also going to assess how well your back and your ankles move because that's heavily related to how the hip's going to feel and how that's going to move. So we'll go through that assessment process. And then after we go through that assessment process, we'll lay out the plan on what's to be had going forward and make sure that we're in alignment on that plan. And in that process, describing the why, um, but describing that why in a way that they're going to understand it the best. Um, not giving them all the lingo, but giving them all the information in place so that they can make the most informed decision on whether yeah. this plan aligns with what they want or it doesn't. And then we go through the plan, they make progress. And ideally, they they leave me after a certain period of time because they're autonomous and they feel great. Yeah. And the cool thing about coaching is some people, even after they don't need you, they still hire you because they like to work with you. And that's usually yep. a good sign that you're a good coach and a good fit for the person as well. I have I have clients that I've been working with for like a couple of years now, and mm -hmm. they definitely don't need me, but they just like working with me. I'm sure it's the same for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, my conversation I always have with those clients is, please know that every time I'm talking about creating autonomous people, I'm not trying to kick you out, but also yeah. I kind of am. And I'm going to keep doing that to make sure that, because I say that because of what something that I found um, to be really prevalent in the personal training industry, which is once people had someone like that, they got taken full advantage of. It was, I'm going to build this trust with this individual and then I'm going to give them 25% of what I give every other client who's mm -hmm. new because I can and because, you know, they love me, they'll stay, it's fine. That was always what I saw with, with long-term clients of personal training gyms was, oh, you know, can you train so-and-so? They've been here for like six years. They honestly just love it. Just, you know, give them a good workout and it'll be fine. And I would always kind of look take, taken back by that and be like, well, what are their goals? Uh, they just want to, you know, be active and stay fit. And I'd be like, okay. At first, I believed that, and then in talking to them and being like, wow, this person has a lot of goals that aren't being met anymore, and they just think it takes this long. So I say that in that, yes, people absolutely stay, and I love that because I love building relationships. What other field do you get to meet people you never otherwise would work with, build relationships with them for years at a time? Um, I'm still training my very first client that I ever had well, cool. before I started college. And it's just the coolest feeling because we just yeah. go, we go way back. He's seen me grow. I've seen him grow like crazy. Yeah. Um, and he'll always tell me like it is too, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm not doing something the way it should be. So it's, it's really cool to develop those relationships and to see people stay with you um, because they're like, Hey, I know, I know that no one else is going to do for me what you've done for me. And I want to, keep being a part of what it is you're doing and in that way also supporting you like those clients are supporting you living your dream providing totally. for your family doing the thing that you love at the same time that's pretty yeah. hard to beat it's funny man my first client ever when i was working at ufit is one of my closest friends he lives here in tampa as well now we talk about it he hates anytime he meets a new friend of mine the first thing i say is like this guy was my first client so <laughs> he's heard the story at least 20 times now Dude, one thing I wanted to ask you, because you obviously work with a lot of individuals who experience joint pain or perhaps struggle with mobility due to discomfort. Um, and based off everything you're sharing, it seems like you really are fantastic at helping people get out of pain. Um, what are some commonalities that you see amongst individuals that experience joint pain independent of where the joint pain is? Let's say knee, hip, shoulder. What are some commonalities? That's the first question. And two, to follow up on that, what are some really simple tips, practical tips that people can implement to help reduce joint? So many good avenues we could go down. Yeah, we can, commonalities. We, this is a good question. So we can, we can go deep into this for sure. Because I think this is stuff that people will actually benefit from because most people who are not professionals in this field do things in a way that could cause some pain, right? And then, or they have pain, chronic pain, because they're older and they've been experiencing pain for years. And then unfortunately, they don't have maybe access to the best information. And so they think if they're experiencing pain, the best thing to do is just not to do anything. And we know that that's not true, right? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's tackle it from that angle. What are some commonalities amongst individuals that experience joint pain, first and foremost? First and foremost, I think it's, 
I think describing the avatar is helpful. So the okay. person who grew up as an athlete mm -hmm. and who has all the my, the muscle memory and mental toughness of an athlete and tries to go be an athlete again when it's been too long. Yeah. Too, too hard, Dude, too fast. I've so many times with clients and it's so funny because when I have initial consults with that type of person, you can tell who that type of person is. Mm -hmm. Like They're like, I'm, I'm ready to go. I used to mm -hmm. play football. And I've had those conversations. I'm like, listen, we're still going to start slow and we're going to build up. And it's like it goes one year out the other and they're mm -hmm. in at 100% the first week. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't get hurt. Many times they do. Yes, 100%. I had the pleasure, just a, a random sort of like uh, fate, if you will, was Rashad Green came into town and needed to work at a gym, chose seriously strong training. I was put on the front lines to work with him. And the first thing I did at first, of course, as a, a sophomore in college was, oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. I'm starstruck. I'm going to work with Rashad Green, All-American, uh, wide receiver for Florida, former Florida State, Jaguar player. I'm freaking out. Um, but the very first thing I had to do was just go back to the principles. And this ties into one of the things I see often with pain was just test. Where's mm -hmm. he at? And I think that's a big, big thing like it goes along with the too hard too fast idea but it's not it goes back to self-awareness like not knowing where you are right now and a lot of people bash i think in the co coaching industry maybe it's only in this circle but maybe it's in the physical therapy circle too of over testing there's this like fear of like oh you're testing too much you know it, all that data is just for not it's but it's the reality is it's not minutia if it matters right it's not minutia that you're lacking this type of rotation in this part of your shoulder if it matters with what your goals are to build a bigger chest and you're going to be putting a lot of what on your chest if you're trying to grow it volume and load so if you're not ready for that then that's a big problem so too hard too fast and lack of awareness are huge ones and i feel like another one is patience being okay with with starting out in a position that doesn't really seem that exciting um and being vulnerable in that way too, with like, I'm going to do something that I suck at and see how that feels going forward and find out what I'm going to feel like after doing that thing that sucks for a while. Figure out what that, what I do, the thing that I'm really bad at for a while. How does I get, do I get better? Do I feel amazing? Am I starting to feel worse? Um, and then the opposite of starting too fast, going too hard is not pushing yourself hard enough seen that a lot too where a lot of people start doing something like a squat for instance and the moment it starts bothering them they they get scared and they run away mm -hmm. or the moment they start getting bothered by something they get scared and run away and the hard part is that it's you can't really blame either of those people because sometimes it was the right decision and sometimes they do need to work on something else before they do that and other times doing a cossack squat is the absolute best way to get your cossack squat better sometimes depending on the person that it is so those are two main ones if i had to put it in a in a box that i can possibly put into those are some of the main ones that i see people getting into pain hey guys some of you may not know that i'm the scientific advisor for a supplement company called outwork nutrition i help with the formulation of new products to help ensure that they're effective and backed by science unlike many other supplement companies out there we don't rely on exaggerated claims or flashy marketing tactics. Instead, we let the science speak for itself. We take pride in formulating products that deliver real results, helping you achieve your fitness goals in a meaningful way. If you're in the market for supplements like protein powder, pre-workout, or recovery products, make sure to check us out at outworknutrition.com. And as a thank you for being an avid listener of this podcast, use code Joey for an exclusive discount at checkout. You can find the link to our website down in the description of this podcast episode. Remember, our goal is to empower you with science-backed supplements that truly make a difference. Choose Outwork Nutrition and elevate your fitness to new heights. What about, and, and I ask this because you hear this all the time from individuals who are maybe, let's say, in their 50s or so, and they're like, oh, I just can't do the stuff I used to do because I'm in pain now that, am I, that I'm older. Is age an inherent variable that increases risk of pain, right? Like if you're old, are you just doomed to be in pain all the time? I'm going to say the favorite phrase of exercise physiologists, correlation versus causation, right? <laughs> it's you, 
I'm, I'm developing a post on this now and I take way too long to develop posts because I'm trying to be way too ethical and way too in detailed. But <laughs> I went and ran routes with my brother. Now I'm, I'm 25, so I've got you know pretty healthy tendons. I also, more importantly, kept up my tendon health as I've transitioned from you know not playing sports, actually stopped playing sports in high school to pursue music and then haven't played sports since really, but been working out a lot and use exercise to experiment for my clients. I went and played football with my brother, ran routes, totally broke his ankles for the record. But after that day, sore like crazy, right? Mm-hmm. My glutes, my adductors, my quad, everything was incredibly sore. I know there's two phrases that I could say to that, right? I could say, man, I remember my brother saying at 25 that he started to feel old at 25. So I could say, man, I'm getting old. Or I can say, man, I haven't moved like that in a while. Yep. And so that kind of leads to the answer to the question, right? It's yes, aging definitely changes things that puts the cards against us just a little bit. Sure. But at the same time, usually, you know, I think the statistic is that 90% of people after the age of 30 will never sprint again a day in their lives. Yeah. And therefore in the same realm will probably never jump a day in their lives. Yeah. After the age of 30, 90% of people, that's crazy. And so a biggest thing I think is definitely as we age, no parent wants to roll on the floor with their kid. I don't know why, because it's hilariously fun and they find it hilarious too. Um, I was playing yesterday or this weekend. Yes, yesterday. Sorry, Sunday with my nephew and nieces and we're playing kickball, their form of kickball outside. He, The oldest one is eight. So these rules are all over the place. But I'm absolutely pelting him with the ball and that's hilarious. The fact that my shoulder can do that is great. Um, I'm also diving and rolling on the ground to avoid his throws, which was also a blast. But I'm just remembering all the time that like people stop doing that because it's not cool for adults to do that for some reason. It's it's taboo. It's like, oh, dude, kids do that. We stop playing. So I think that's the biggest thing with age is people stop playing. They start acting like adults. For those of you just listening, I'm doing quotations here. Acting like adults, trying to to move less, be more stiff, be more rigid, and your body follows suit with that. If you, yeah. I made a video about this that was hilarious, but it's you know kind of a niche. If you want to get really good at sitting, just sit all the time. <laughs> it's that easy. Sit yeah, all the a, time, and you're gonna get really good at it. Yeah, we, we just that's adapt to stimulus, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think it's necessarily an intentional change that people go through in the sense nope. that like. I'm going to intentionally be more sedentary, but just the way things happen, right? Like you're busier with work. Uh, maybe you live a little bit further from wherever you go on a daily basis. So you drive more, you walk less, and just slowly over time, you become more physically inactive. And then you have this idea of the type of person you used to be and the things you used to be able to do. And you don't have the physical resilience to do those things anymore, but you do them and then you're in pain. And it's like, oh man, it must be because I'm old. It's like, no, it's not because you're old. It's just because you haven't done those things in a while. If you slowly expose yourself to those things, you wouldn't be in pain, right? I always tell this like one story that I never forget when I worked with a client actually back at UFIT. Um, She was probably in like, I don't know, early 70s around there. Um, Anyways, she couldn't sit under control like she couldn't sit unless she would plop down because her knee was in crazy pain um and all we did literally all we did was find the range of motion that felt comfortable under control right so like under eccentric control like this person could sit without any eccentric control they would just plop down plopping down is not the same thing as controlling your way down right and when we started she could only really go down about 15 or 20 degrees before she started feeling some pretty bad discomfort and i would tell her okay let's just go there but just hold that for a couple seconds and then stand and let's just do three sets of however many reps you can before you feel really bad pain and that's all we did and the week after she can go a little bit deeper and the week after that she can go a little bit deeper it's just challenging yourself challenging yourself slightly uh not being afraid of discomfort and slowly pushing yourself as your body becomes more resilient i think after a year or close to a year, she was doing full range of motion goblet squat with like 30 or 40 pound dumbbell. To be able to do that in your 70s is incredibly impressive, right? Because for 
uh, activities of daily living, you don't really need to be able to lift more than 40 or 50 pounds realistically. If you're in your 70s and you can do a squat with 40 pounds, it's pretty damn good. And this is a person who thought she'd never be able to do a squat because she was already in so much pain, right? So from your perspective, man, what are some things or, or pieces of advice that you give to anybody who's experiencing joint pain, right? And we'll say, we'll, we'll put uh, the, the context here, like outside of serious injury, right? Because if you have like a really bad uh, tendon or ligament tear, like maybe you shouldn't do this right away. But what are some, some common things that people can do that should help reduce pain? I mean, the biggest one is just move, right? It's yeah. one of the biggest things in research. We see that pain is biopsychosocial, meaning it's imp- it's infused with all of these different things that like sometimes people's pain is a lot more psychological than it is physical. Yeah. Um, you see people, right, who have weakness somewhere and it's always chicken or the egg, right? Do they have this neurological inhibition happening because there's a tear or is their nervous system sort of protecting something because they're fearful of something or is that pain actually going to happen? Um, and so one of the biggest things I think is just move. If you can walk, just walk. Um, I <laughs> built a funny reputation at the old gym I worked at with, um, I had a client who came in to work on the basic stuff. She wanted to get stronger. She wanted to lose some weight. Um, she wanted to lose some fat specifically and build a little bit of strength to get some more freedom back. And she fell down the stairs and fractured her distal tibia. And she calls me, tells me the news. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. That's terrible that happened to you. Um, This was on Sunday and her sessions are Monday and Wednesday. And I was like, gosh, that's terrible. So how are you getting to and from work? And she's like, I'm having my assistant drive me. I was like, oh, that's great. So good. You're able to go back to work. I know you really love that. And, you know, it'd be terrible if you had to stop and just sit at home. And I was like, man, we got to another conversation. I was like, okay, well, I'm excited to see you tomorrow. We'll talk more about this. She was like, what? I've been a cast and I can't walk. I was like, yeah, your arms move fine. So I just say that story and that example, because if you can move something, you should move it. Um, It's really cool. But we even see studies that like if you have a a short-term injury, even like you fractured your wrist, if you train your other arm, your other arm your opposite arm. So if it's your left that's injured and you're using your right, if you train your opposite arm, your other arm will actually adapt slightly too. It can Mm -hmm. get stronger, just just crazy cool. Um, You'll have a little bit less atrophy um, and you'll have an easier time recovering when you come back. In the same way, if you have something chronic, you know, still train, still do different things. Just just try to do what you can do. Um, And I'll touch on something just because you mentioned it. Like sometimes it is, because a lot of people get discouraged when they hear stuff like this at times, depending on the person about just start, you know, at this squat, at this height, just start anywhere. And they're like, yeah, I get that. Every time I do that, this happens. And it's just brutal. I'm working with a guy right now uh, remotely, um, which in that setting, the feedback is everything. Communication is everything. It's so key. This We're talking about a guy that bends over and his back flares up and now he can't move for weeks. And so it's very, very sensitive. And so we're working through all these assessment process. Like how do you assess somebody like that remotely without hurting them? And then all these other things. So within that process, I just, I just coming back to what you were talking about, about somebody just start somewhere. That's absolutely true for so many people. But then my grandfather who's had nine back surgeries, that's a conversation for another time, but long story short is very stiff, has lots of replaced fake joints, everything. Mm-hmm. And he, all of a sudden, after getting sick, getting in the hospital, had some thyroid issues, came back out, bedridden for a while, right? Got even more stiff. Could not step up onto a step. And their home is all steps. Front door, garage door, back door, all steps. So all of a sudden, this man could not get in and out of his own home. They garden all the time. They do all this stuff. And he had therapists coming to his house, physical therapists coming to his house and working on him with strength and squatting and all these things to try to progress him happened for months and no progress happened for months and no change. And he finally reached out to me, um, which I felt terrible. I'm like, I should have reached out to him. What am I doing? 
but I'm so busy with like baby and house and everything. I'm just, you know, whatever my excuses are, but long story short, we get connected and he's like, I know you do this stuff. Just see if you can come help me come to his house. And the first thing I did was I just tried to see where he was. And this is the biggest thing I think professionals and the individuals working with a professional should see. If you've worked with anybody and there, it was with their expertise. So like, obviously if we're talking about, you know, working with a chiropractor on, you know, your nutrition, that's not what we're talking about here, but working with the right professional for the right thing. If they didn't help you, it's because they failed to meet you where you were. They failed to meet you where you are right now. Those physical therapists, I'll say it as boldly as I possibly can, were failing him because they didn't meet him where he was. All we did was check, do you have the proper flexibility and mobility, two different things, to do what's need to be done to get up a step? Because what they were hearing is this guy's weak, this guy's old, he needs therapy, traditional therapy, we're going to work with him. Whereas I asked him, what are you trying to do? He's like, I just need to be able to walk outside. I can't Mm -hmm. get down into my house. I can't get back in. Then your grandmother has to come help me and she can't lift me because I'm really heavy. Like, I can't do this. We just assessed him. Turns out he was literally just lacking ankle dorsiflexion, which is when your knee translates forward over your foot. We did some close stance squats with him grabbing onto his countertop. He pushed his knees forward as far as they would go. He's like, oh yeah, that feels really stiff. I was like, okay, do that. Does that hurt at all? No, it doesn't hurt. Okay. Let's do that 30 times. We did that 30 times. We walked him over to the stairs and he walked down the stairs and up the stairs by himself. It's not It's not the fact that it was that complicated. It was that no yeah. one wanted to meet him where he was. Yeah. And sometimes it is. So I just say that to encourage if anybody is listening that has done what you're describing of, I tried that, Joey. I tried the, you know, squat at this height. This didn't hurt and go through it. Sometimes that's the right thing to do. And other times you just need a professional to assess you. And it stinks that that's where we're at right now, where we don't have, everyone doesn't have a professional like that near them. Right. Yeah. And it it can be hard and discouraging. No, totally, man. That's a a really good example. Um, Because yeah, I'm sure your, your grandfather would benefit from general strengthening movements. And I'm sure one of the main issues was that they were perhaps prescribing movements that were beneficial, but not necessarily for the thing that he was struggling with specifically. Yep. Right. He got stronger. Um, It's not the right way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I wanted to challenge you a little bit more on the recommendation of just move because that can be fairly generic, uh, or Mm. I'll say fake, even though I agree with you. Right. But what are some things that people listen? I agree. Some circumstances people need to work with a professional to assess what's going on. But there are some general things that people perhaps can do to figure out why they're experiencing pain, what they're struggling with, and how to improve. Sure. Um, And listen, I know pain is specific, and there are hundreds of different examples we could talk about. Maybe we can talk about some of the main ones that people experience, right? Like people experience some shoulder discomfort. They can't get their, their arm over their head or some knee discomfort. Like how does somebody go about taking the advice of move more and then actually improve upon their condition. Absolutely. Yes. I wanted to keep expanding on this. So thank you for bringing come back to it. Um, I love, have you listened to Dr. Stuart McGill at all with different things like this? I know who he is. I haven't uh, listened much to his content now. Sure. No problem. So he has a really great book called The Back Mechanic. Mm-hmm. And he, this is how I talk to all my clients about pain in general, which is it's partially what you were talking about with what you did for your client which is just try to learn the characteristics of it. And I, I like to give people names to things. And if they have names to things, they can start defining them and then be able to organize them better. So one of the things that um, I learned from Active Life was just this idea of irritability index. Frequency, intensity, duration. Like those are three different characteristics of pain that all of a sudden separate pain into different things, right? Yeah. How When it does hurt, how long does it hurt for? And how much does it hurt? And then how frequently does that happen to you? And trying to learn like what are your, what kind of things aggravate it? What kind of things make it mad? And what kind of things tend to help? And I think this is something that I believe you would agree with nutrition even. Like if you just start journaling that, that can be extremely helpful for somebody dealing with pain is just try to write down, even if you do, let's say worst case scenario, it doesn't work. 
you can still bring that when you go to try to go to a professional and be like, hey, I've got all this in detail because I've been writing this stuff down and figuring it out. So writing down, you know, characteristics of it, try to define it a little bit. And then at the very least, you'll be able to navigate around certain things like, oh, I realized that when I go walking, that doesn't hurt. But when I go downhill, that's when it starts to bother me. Right. And so then it's it still moves, try to move. The basically that general uh advice comes from the idea of don't stop moving. Do not stop moving. Try to write down things, try to define what's happening in a best way you possibly can and just sort of journal about it. And then kind of have a, your own little health journal, if you will, about this is this is how this sort of operates. I know that I and a lot of people come to me with that and they've been able to do a lot of those things. And those people either couldn't get as far as they wanted to or they did get as far as they want to and I never spoke to them. So it it at least allows people to have some sort of freedom with themselves and that's something that actually Active Life preaches a lot of which is if we can teach people how to move when they're in pain and how to deal with it, that's better than getting that person out of pain because pain's going to come back yeah, some totally. way. So you're going to be in pain at some point. But if we can teach you how to navigate it, that's that's the best thing that we can do for you. So naming stuff, journaling that down, and also starting to understand that there's different types of pain, not just different frequencies, intensities, and durations, but there's also different types in the sense that there's simply irritation, like which to be aware of, like if it's been happening for a very long time, then that could start to kind of feel things dull. Mm -hmm. But it could also mean that something might have changed. Like, oh, before I would get this back pain when I did this thing. Now it's more of a dull pain. Okay, so something's changed. Maybe it's time to reassess. And by reassess, I don't mean all the fancy perfect tests. I mean, as the individual is saying, can I go on a walk? Can I sit down okay? Can I sit down, you know, favoring one side? You know, when I go to stand up with your daily activities, assess. How do they feel? What does it make you feel like? Are you fearful of it? Are you not fearful of it, et cetera? So I hope that's more useful and more specific, but don't stop moving, but start to define and sort of create a journal of what you're experiencing so that you can help navigate it better for yourself. Create a sense of autonomy. Are you tired of spending countless hours grocery shopping, cooking, and preparing your meals? I get it. Time is precious, and that's where Icon Meals comes into play. I've partnered with Icon Meals to bring you delicious, macro-friendly, and high-protein meals that will make it easier than ever for you to achieve your fitness goals. I understand that you may have hesitations over the cost of a meal prep service compared to cooking food at home. But let's face it, how often do you spend more money eating out because you didn't have time to prepare your food at home anyways? With Icon Meals, you not only save time, but you invest in your health. These meals are carefully crafted to be healthier and more in line with your fitness goals than most of the food that you eat out anyways. So why wait? Visit iconmeals.com and explore their wide array of mouth-watering meals. And as a special bonus for listening to this podcast, use code JOSEPH10 at checkout for a special discount off of your order. By the way, you can find all of the necessary links in the description of this podcast. Don't let time be a barrier to your success. Choose Icon Meals and fuel your journey towards a healthier, fitter you. Yeah, totally. And perhaps maybe even going a little bit before uh, further than that, what are some actionable tips that people can um, think about or use as as guidelines to determine whether or not it's okay for them to like lean into that pain, right? Because the reason why I bring this up, it's like, hey, if you can't bring your shoulder fully overhead because you're in pain and you can only bring it up, let's say 20 degrees right now before you start feeling discomfort, what are some things that you would recommend individuals uh, do and think about in terms of guidelines to determine whether it's okay to lean into that pain and push themselves a little bit forward, right? Because both you and I agree that in order to be able to do some of these things that you can't do because you currently experience pain, you have to feel comfortable with leaning into the discomfort, right? Like some of the things that you have to do and from the perspective of corrective exercises are going to feel uncomfortable. It doesn't mean it has to be extremely painful, but it's not going to be maybe completely pain-free either. And I think this is where a lot of people spend a lot of time just spinning their wheels 
because they are so afraid to feel even the slightest bit of them, mm -hmm. right? What are your thoughts on that? So I think if we're talking about that specific individual, the person who is really fearful of pain, then give yourself a simple rule. If it's a below a four out of 10 pain, keep going. Yeah. If it's, if it's getting worse as you go, you should probably stop. If yeah. it's getting better as you go, you should probably keep going. Yeah. One of my, a more intricate rule of that is if you stop, if you're doing it, kind of feels iffy and I'm not really sure and you stop and now it's worse, you probably should reassess, either not do that exercise or maybe you're doing that exercise poorly or something. Yeah. But for the individual, for everybody else, if it's a reactive tendinopathy issue, you should not be pushing through pain because the issue is that it's irritated and it's not going to stop getting irritated until you stop irritating it. It has to, it has to have a chance to heal. Um, and that's why I know it's, it's kind of frustrating to talk about, but it's just important to make it clear that it is so individualized. Yeah. And like when there's, when there are people who are in pain who need rest, sure that they need rest, but then as you said, then they may need to push through pain later. That four out of 10 rule is a great one of don't push past four out of 10 if it's that bad. And also what type of pain, was it a tweak and then it went away, twinge and it went away? Is it happening every yeah. rep? Did it just happen once? If it just happened once, then give it another rep. See how that goes. I love using three to five reps. Three to five reps. If it felt okay by rep five, then maybe we continue. Or maybe we just stop there for the day. Yeah, that's such a great, um, great perspective. I do something similar in terms of like having a scale and being like, hey, if it doesn't hurt more than this, then you're probably good to continue. And if it's not getting worse, then you're probably good to continue as well, right? Because oftentimes it's like people are afraid to move through pain. And it's like, the, in my opinion, one of the best indicators is like, are you doing the movement? Is it getting worse? If it's not getting worse and it's not really painful, there's just slight discomfort, you're probably okay to continue doing that, right? And if maybe the pain is a little bit more and it's uh, getting a little bit worse, well, maybe maybe the answer isn't not to exercise at all, but maybe we look at some modifications that don't cause discomfort, right? I've seen it time and time again where like a client may feel discomfort doing some sort of hip hinging movement, whether it's a deadlift or an RDL or whatever, they feel some low back discomfort. And so they think that now for the next couple of weeks, they can't do any lower body movements or any back movements. Like, wait, mm -hmm. wait a minute. Like if you do a leg press or, or a squat or a leg extension or a leg curl, do you feel pain doing those? And it's like, no, not really. And I'm like, well, then we can do those, right? Like, mm -hmm. yes, you're still putting some tension on your back when you do a Smith machine squat or even a barbell squat. Yes, you put tension directly on your back if you're doing a rowing movement. But if you're not feeling the same pain, that's a really good indicator that you're fine to do those movements, right? And I really wanted to get to that point because, again, and I experience this pretty much at least once a month with a client where it's like, oh, I feel a little pain doing this movement. So maybe I'm just not going to train you know, my legs at all because it hurt when I was doing this one leg movement. It's like, hold up. Like we have a training plan that includes a number of exercises for the lower body. If you're feeling discomfort with one of them and not the others, we can just take it easy on that one and, and push the others, right? Mm -hmm. Another good indicator is like sometimes it's load dependent. Sometimes it's uh, tempo dependent, range of motion dependent, right? Like uh, another perfect example is like, We'll use a deadlift again. Somebody may be deadlifting, I don't know, 300 pounds of conventional deadlift and they feel some pain. Like, I shouldn't deadlift. I'm like, hold up. Try, try doing like, try 100 pounds. Maybe do it with a slower tempo. Go a little bit deeper, include a pause. Maybe do it more like a stiff leg deadlift. So it's a little bit more challenging. Does that cause pain? And sometimes the answer is still yes, but substantially less, right? Mm -hmm. It used to be a seven out of 10. Now this is a three out of 10. It's like, okay, this is better than not doing anything. And in fact, actually getting some movement in, getting some blood flow in the area is going to expedite that healing process. Mm -hmm. I feel like people think that if they are feeling pain, it means that it's going to take them longer to heal. And that's not necessarily true either, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure you've experienced this as well, where you do feel pain doing something. You don't do anything for a couple of weeks and the pain is still there. So not doing anything is not a solution to yep. get out of pain in most circumstances, right? Um, so I'm happy we touched on that. One follow-up question I wanted to ask you on this is do you have maybe like a handful of exercises 
that you're a really big fan of in terms of like preventative mobility style movements that you like recommending to most clients to help reduce pain, increase range of motion, et cetera? Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to hit you with a depends answer, but then also give some actual sure. ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's definitely an important distinction between something you were saying a second ago between someone who is, you know, it's the same thing with nutrition coaching, right? Like how intense you're trying to be with tracking macros or tracking calories yeah. or whatever you're doing, like we're making sure your micronutrients are in order. There's general health. And then there's, I'm trying to hit a deadlift PR. It's like totally trying to hit a deadlift PR and that's all you're trying to do, then that better be your sport. Not that it's yeah. bad to hit PRs. Like uh, talking to the guy who just destroys himself in the gym all the time, like I get it. It's great. Yeah. But also we want to make sure we define really, really well why we're doing what we're doing in the first place and use that to base, us, base our decisions off of because it could be like you said that that person needs to do that exercise and this leads into you know what kind of exercise they could do, five to six of them, that would be really good probably. But it's just, are you doing this to be able to be really functional and not by, I don't mean the traditional sense of functional, like it's being uh, used in a terrible way in our industry right now. But I mean, doing the things that you like to do, physical freedom is how I would define it instead. Are you trying to acquire physical freedom? Or are you just trying to get bigger pecs? Okay. Bigger pecs? Then heck yes. Let's do any other exercise that does not bother you. The flat bench bothers you. You do not need flat bench to grow your pecs. <laughs> like, don't you worry. We'll figure out everything else to do it besides flat bench and just avoid it. Um, like yeah. you were saying. And then if it is like, no, like my shoulder is bothering me and, you know, I feel it in horizontal press as well as other things. Okay. Then we'll start to work on that stuff if it's bothering you when lifting your kid overhead or something else you're wanting to do. But generally, when I, when talking about mobility or, you know, improving functionality, I always, right now, might change in five years, right? But right now, it's always coming back to the global movement patterns. Like, take it back to a squat and then just change up that movement. So within a squat, within a bench, which would be like a horizontal press in a extension or neutral biased position for the shoulder, or a lunge, what type are you doing? Well, I always do forward just try going sideways so many times. That's like, that's, that's why it's such a fascinating field because the barrier, this is like prescription, but everyone has access to the prescription. Mm -hmm. Like you can just throw anything and everything. It could be the most powerful thing ever. That's why you see all those videos of three movements you need to do to be out of back pain. Not everybody, but okay. But just try a different plane. So in that way, that's why I'm saying this one, Cossack squats for some people just are such a weakness of theirs they can stand to lengthen the muscles that are inside their legs the adductors just doing something to challenge those doing something to challenge the glutes in in more isolation or trying to feel them more when you're doing a hinge like an rdl or a deadlift um i personally think the rdl romanian deadlift versus the deadlift is a great one for people because most people that i've seen in the general population can barely even touch their toes but they're deadlifting yeah. from the floor. It's like, you could just do the, and then they're talking about getting their hamstrings longer by trying to do the stretches that they never do that they also hate. You could just do a Romanian deadlift and get your hamstrings longer. Like, that's going to get them stronger anyways. If you're looking for hypertrophy, it'll help you there too. So double it, like double it up there and just go with the RDL. And that's when you're starting from the top and you lower yourself down slowly and you keep all the load in the hamstrings my gosh. I mean, if you've ever done that the right way is I call it a disgusting stretch because you just feel this gnarly tension all the way through your backside. And you're like, I'm, I'm going to fall apart here. This is terrible. And do it with just a bar first and then just work your way up there. So those are first two, definitely Cossacks, Romanian deadlifts for the shoulders. I find so many people limited with shoulder flexion, which is in going overhead, doing something like a dumbbell pullover. A lot of people benefit from that, especially with if we're just talking about desk jockeys in general, sitting in this position all the time. Sometimes that makes a short lat and then you can lengthen that by just straight arms yeah. going overhead with dumbbell pullover. Feels great. Um, if you do it with really heavy weight when you get really strong, that's a great way to grow your lats is 
doing some sort of pullover movement like that. That's a staple, the dumbbell, not necessarily, but the pullover in general is a staple in bodybuilding. Um, I love, love pull-ups because they're so challenging from changing up the grip to also making sure that you have good shoulder mobility. So it really challenges you. If you can't hang there from the bar, that would be my fourth one is being able to hang from a bar passively, but then you also obviously start to pull, pull yourself over the bar. And that also can improve a lot. The last one I'll say, just to give a shout out to the, to the feet and the ankles is going back to the global movement patterns, having like a close stance squat or something like that, where you're challenging the ankles and not worrying about like, no, you won't get great depth at first because your ankles are tight and everything else. Yeah. And just working through that range of motion. If I had to pick five or so, like that, that would be my choice. Most people are you can benefit a, from those. Totally. And I agree with you on those certainly. And are you a fan of any sort of like traditional body weight mobility style exercises that people do at home, like dead bugs, for example, or anything like that? I'm a fan of all movements, Joey. Yeah. No, I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> um, I know you are. I guess I, I'm trying to hip, uh, hip I'm 90, 90. To bit... You remember those? Hip Where 90, 90. That's your sitting on your butt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love that combined with a hinge. So you go into mm -hmm. hip 90, 90, which is, so I'll describe it pretty plainly. Sit on your butt, have your feet on the floor with your knees bent, and you just let your knees fall to the same side, to the left. Yeah. And then you try to get 90 degrees between your left leg and your right leg. And then from there, you hinge into your left leg. So you'd hinge using your glute into that side. It's like a, it's similar to a modified pigeon, but you're loading it was, is the difference for me. That's one of my favorite bodyweight ones. If I had to, to pick a favorite without any yeah. equipment, anything at all. And you can use that by like leaning back is an easy way to regress that you just lean back and move your hips side to side. It's I I've, it's very rare it's apart from someone with like a hip replacement um, or some really gnarly, you know, hip issues that wouldn't benefit from that exercise. Yeah, no, totally. That's a really good one for hip mobility. Um, and I'm going to say for those of you guys listening, just Google the exercise because that's going to be really hard to do <laughs> by just listening to the demonstration. You know, it's one of those. Rewind like, yeah. and follow me step by step. Yeah. Um, it's so funny now that you brought up hanging from a pull-up because I was just with a group of, of people um, and they were, you know, uh, older individuals that have been active their whole life. They're like in their fifties and they were talking about, um, how they're not fans of hanging from a bar as a, let's use the term assessment tool to assess perhaps like grip strength or shoulder mobility because it's inherently dangerous and can mm. cause shoulder injury. And I was like, that's just not true at all. Like hanging is not going to cause shoulder injury. If you've never hung from a bar and like you try to hang as long as you possibly can, yeah, you might injure yourself. But again, it's because you never do that, right? And if you're 30, 40 pounds overweight, that's a lot of load to put on your shoulders. And if you don't train your shoulders through a full range of motion in your lats, yes, you're putting yourself in a compromised position because you don't do that. Mm -hmm. But that movement's not inherently dangerous. And in fact, getting yourself to the point where you can just dead hang from a bar means you probably have some pretty healthy shoulders, some pretty uh, mobile, flexible lats, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's this idea that like, and so many people have this idea that taking certain exercises towards the extreme range of motion of that movement is inherently harmful. And it's usually because people try to take that extreme range of motion with the same load that they do a smaller range of motion with, right? It's like, hey, if you quarter squat and you use 100 pounds and now you hear somebody tell you that you should do a full range of motion squat. And you put a hundred pounds on your back and you just drop as low as you can. And then you're in pain. Yeah, no shit, right? Like it's not rocket science. Like mm -hmm. you yeah. haven't done that range of motion before. And now you're loading it with the weight that you usually use for half the range of motion. It's like, just drop the load substantially mm -hmm. and improve the range of motion. And then slowly start to load it again. Once you're doing the full range of motion, right? You can say the same thing about a dead hang with a pull-up. It's like, if you use an assistant pull-up, and let's say you weigh 200 pounds and you used 160 pounds of assistance. So you're just 
really hanging 40 pounds, like you're not going to get hurt like that. Doesn't, it's not a lot of load, right? I mean, you slowly progress it. It's just, again, for most people listening, it's when you do too much too fast. No movement is inherently harmful. Again, if you don't do something and you do it and you do it really intensely, that's where I think risk of injury really lies, not necessarily in the movement itself. And I'm going to ask you, do you agree? But I'm sure you agree with that statement. Oh, yeah. We give way too much credit to the power of a movement and yeah. are too afraid to tell someone, hey, I'll be honest, you really suck at overhead stuff. Like yeah. really, really bad. Now, I have an inherent problem with a coach saying that without any like expertise on the on the matter. Sure. Um, but at the same time, yes, you give way too much credit to the movement. And if you take what you're talking about, which the the movement stuff and the pain stuff seems to get more convoluted and complicated and scary. But if you just go back to the principles of specificity, like, yes, if you're doing like, I remember distinctly, I was doing front squats with a, with 300 pounds. And I was like, oh, I want to do a zercher squat, which is when you hold the bar in your forearms, like, this will be fun. And I was like trying to remember, like, I was like, all right, so if I'm doing a front squat 300, you know, I'll be all right with, with, with 95 pounds. That's not bad. Like, no, I, you've never done a zercher squat do nothing at first or as little as you possibly can. But I'm like, no, 95 pounds. Got it. Tweaked my left spinal erector. Just, <laughs> and and yeah. I just breath taken out of me. I was like, <clears throat> I was like, what yeah. did I do? But it's, it's, it's really cause it does come down to the principles again of just, I have not trained that movement. I have no yeah. business and it's different. Um, but it's also hard because you, it's how deep you're going with those principles. But yes, I totally agree. We give the movements way too much credit and don't, look at the individual and say, dude, this is not something that you're going to be able to handle right yeah. now. Let's go, let's go way back yeah. and start there. And to follow up on that too, because, you know, you did a Zercher squat and you experienced some pain. Some people do that and then they immediately say, I'm injured. Hmm. And it's like pain doesn't necessarily mean injury either, right? You, you can experience pain for a number of reasons. And I, I'm, Sure, you can touch on this way better than I can, but I always tell my clients that I'm like, pain does not mean injury. If we use, if we define injury as actual structural damage to some sort of tissue, just because you experience some discomfort does not mean that you have an injury. And I'm really big on the language there because people inherently say, I injured myself versus I feel some discomfort, right? The language is very different there. Like I injured myself unconsciously makes the person believe that they one did something wrong that they shouldn't do. And that two, you can't do stuff moving forward because now mm -hmm. you are injured. When in reality, we've all tweaked something before, whether it's doing unfamiliar movements or even familiar movements, and you understand the difference, right? Like you and I have been doing this for a long time. We know the difference between being injured and like having a tweak, right? Like I could go in and deadlift and like tweak something in my hip and be like, oh, like it hurts. Yeah, but it's not that big of a deal. And like move for the next couple, two, two or three days. And like, I'm not in pain anymore. Whereas somebody might experience the same thing, feel like they, they're injured. I'm big on psychology too. I think if you, if you think you're injured and you think you really can't do anything that you're going to exacerbate that pain, you're going to feel it for longer as well. And they don't do anything for a couple of days. It doesn't get better. It confirms their idea that they're injured, right? So I think it's really important to differentiate between like feeling some discomfort and being injured. They're not mm -hmm. synonymous. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, through my education, I've learned that there's there's irritation, which is the it is the negative response to a conscious stimulus. There's pain, which is the emotional negative response to some sort of stimulus and it's also define conscious. what you mean by emotional because people might be thinking like yeah it's emotional, like a negative like fat or happy like yeah. it i mean it makes you feel bad whereas totally. irritation you're like eh, it's whatever it's it's the simplest way to describe it so irritation just being that conscious response to a stimulus and there's not really any emotion involved with it it's like yeah it's irritating my knee's irritated um pain is adding that negative emotional response and it's also usually made worse by uncertainty and fear 
Mm. So many times you see just just a professional that somebody it has to be somebody they trust who says, oh, it's it's just your rotator cuff. That's what this is. Immediate relief. Immediate relief of symptoms, immediate relief of, and it's powerful and it, and it matters. And then injury is a decision that you can't. So do you have a shoulder injury or do you have a throwing injury? A throwing injury means, yep, I can't throw right now. That may be absolutely true, but it, you don't have a shoulder injury. That means your shoulder is completely done for, can't do anything. So that's mm -hmm. the first thing that I teach my clients is one of the first things I teach them is that exact language difference of an injury is you can't. And just mm -hmm. because it's your shoulder, there may be certain things like you might have a pressing injury. Dude, I can't press here. I can't press here. I can't do it body weight. I just worked with um, an individual who could not press anything over it. He couldn't get his arm overhead. He couldn't press this way, anything. So I would be okay calling that a pressing injury right now, mm -hmm. but you don't have a shoulder injury. Well, my shoulder is what hurts. Yes, absolutely. But that's pain. And we can do all of these other things. So yeah, I agree with you completely. Those are the definitions that I would add. But you hit a nail on the head with saying that it's not, it's not the same to say that you're injured versus you're in pain. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, listen, I know we didn't talk about the original topic that we said we were <laughs> going to talk about. So with that said, I would love to have you back on the show to talk about behavior change specifically. Love that. And tips to help people actually change behaviors. Because I wanted to leave this conversation and say, okay, like a lot of people know the things they need to do as well physically and with nutrition as well, right? It, like these things go hand in hand and not just nutrition. We can group all of these things under overall lifestyle. People who have goals around improving health, feeling better, losing weight. Um, oftentimes, maybe people don't have the same degree of expertise that you and I have, but they know some of the things that they should be doing, right? Mm -hmm. They know that they should be moving. They know that they should be eating a little bit healthier. They know that they should be maybe drinking a little less, managing their stress, sleeping a little better, a little bit better, but they fail to do so, right? And it's like, why do some people have such a hard time making change? Um, I think that would be a great follow-up conversation. I think that conversation itself will take at least an hour. Um, so I say we schedule it again in a couple of weeks from now, if you're okay with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, listen, I appreciate you giving me some of your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, do you mind sharing with people where they can find you at if they want to follow you on social media or perhaps hire you for coaching? And we'll go from there. Absolutely. So I have my social media on Instagram at Hoke Health, H-O-C-H Health. Um, and then I'm also on YouTube. There's going to be some content rolling in soon. So Obviously Sweet. working on different things with with master's degree coming up and everything like that. Something I forgot to touch on in the beginning, actually, that I'll be starting that in the fall. But um, the goal with that Instagram page and YouTube page is to be free information about this type of stuff for individuals. Um, I never want to work with someone if it's not time for us to work together or they can get everything they needed from me for free. Information is always free. So those are the main ways that you can kind of check out what I'm doing and get any information that you might feel like you need and get in touch with you on those platforms. And then of course, my website at hokehealthandwellness.com, which that links on my Instagram bio and YouTube bio as well. So yeah. Yeah. And the links to your stuff will be on the description of this episode as well. If you just scroll down in the description, you can find the social media and coaching business as well. Again, dude, thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation. I think it was really practical as well. I'm sure a ton of people are going to benefit from this. And I look forward to our next conversation too. Yeah, me too, Joey. I appreciate the time. This was super fun.